board chair. And I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, thank you, everyone. And we are holding the meeting electronically and it's being recorded because of COVID-19. And with that, I will move to the roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. I do not have any information of any new members or alternates. So if there is a new member, if you'd raise your hand at this time, we'll welcome you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, and then everyone just make sure that you are ready to unmute yourself when your name is called. And if for some reason you're not able to state that you're present uh, when your name is called, we'll ask at the end for people to raise their hand so we can get them for the record. All right, here we go. Aaron Brockett of Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Present. Adam Zarin of the Governor's Office. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Anita Seitz of Westminster. Lindsay Smith of Westminster. Bill Gipp of Erie. Connected. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. Present. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Right here, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Happy to be here. Awesome. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Here. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Jacob LeBure of Lakewood. Dana Gutwein of Lakewood. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. James Kumerly of Lockbuoy. Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuoy. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Bill Holland of Arapahoe County. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockerell of Foxfield. Here. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Here. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Here. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Here. <sighs> Christopher Larson of Nederland. Larry Vidum of Bennett. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Present. Linda Olson of Inglewood. Here. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margo Ramsden of Bomar. Michael Hillman, Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Frank of Commerce City. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Pamela Grove of Littleton. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Sean Perret of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Tushare of Glendale. 
Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Glad to be here. Thank you. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here. Tammy Mauer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. This is Andy Kerr of Jefferson County uh, for Tracy Kraft Tharp. Thank you so much, Andy. All right. Uh, Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. Here. Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. All right. And with that, uh, if you did not hear your name called, if you want to raise a virtual hand so we can make sure that you are noted for the record. So we have George Teal and Anita Seitz that came in and Tom um, Dietz in the chat and Adam Cushing in the chat. That's Tim Dietz. Dietz. I'm sorry about that, Tim. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Tim Dietz. Is there anyone else that we missed? And let me just check this attendee list. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, did you already say Bill Van Meter and Anita Seitz? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. I didn't say Bill Van Meter, but I should have. Hi, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. And we have a quorum. And so if I could uh, please get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Teal. Is there a second? Second. second. And I just wasn't fast enough to see who said second. So if you could just let us. Catherine Whitman from the county. Thank you, Director Whitman. All right, so there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. That takes us to our public hearing this evening. So the public hearing is on amendments to the public engagement plan, people-centered planning projects and services. You'll find it as attachment A if you're following along in your packet. And just one moment. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ashley Stolzman, chair of the Denver Regional Council of Government's Board of Directors. I wanna thank you all for participating today. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on proposed amendments to the Dr. Cox Public Engagement Plan, People-Centered Planning, Projects, and Services. The public hearing of Dr. Cog is hereby convened. The purpose of the hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents I just noted to provide comments to our board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing as receiving public comment is important to the board's decision-making process. All comments received via email, Dr. Cog website, or in writing have automatically been included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to this public hearing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those who are testifying. Lisa Hood of Dr. Cog staff, uh, who will now summarize the proposed amendments to Dr. Cog's public engagement plan. Lisa. Thank you, Chair Stolzman, and good evening, Board of Directors. So tonight I am joined by my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, a transportation planner with Dr. Cog, and I am public engagement planner here at Dr. Cog. So we're, we just have a few slides to summarize these amendments to the public engagement plan. So I'm gonna go through those. For those of you that were on the board back in 2019, you'll remember that you adopted a new public engagement plan in May of that year. And what that public engagement plan really is, is a guidebook for our Dr. Cog staff to be able to plan and implement effective public engagement. And it also serves as a way to tell our residents about 
the guiding principles for engagement, the goals for engagement, and how we implement those engagement strategies effectively in all of these regional decisions that we do. And really all together, the document is intended to be a statement of Dr. Cog's commitment to meaningful engagement in all of these regional decisions that are being made. So over the last two years of implementing the plan, we've discovered a few things that we would like to amend. The first of which is directly related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So although the plan did reference online engagement efforts and we had already started working that into a lot of our engagement strategies, um, we, after going through 15 full months of purely virtual engagement, we've learned a lot. So we wanted to incorporate that more holistically throughout the plan. So there are more, more references to those methods sprinkled throughout the plan, as well as some best practices about virtual engagement. So for instance, we have additional language in there about um, when you're holding virtual public meetings, virtual public hearings such as this, making sure that there are opportunities for people to participate if they do not have computer access. So making sure that there are opportunities for people to call in as they can with this Zoom interface. So things like that we've incorporated into the plan. Additionally, when starting to think about revising the plan, we realized that there wasn't really any direction in the plan about the process for those revisions. So we've incorporated some language as well about what would constitute kind of an ad administrative mod modification. So something minor, non-substantive to the plan, fixing typos, changing design, things like that, that wouldn't require a formal board action versus a full amendment like what we're doing tonight, um, which are substantive changes that do require the formal board action and then would have a 45 day public review and comment period. So we've included that in the uh, proposed amendments tonight. Similarly, we've also specified a process for different types of amendments to the regional transportation plan. Over the last two years, our transportation team has been working on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, and they've had lots of discussions with CDOT and RTD, the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency talking about what would constitute a major amendment versus um, uh, just a regular amendment. And so that, that guidance has also been included in the, in the plan and reference to that kind of policy document that they've been working on. And then taking the opportunity as we were making those other revisions, we wanted to take the opportunity to fix some just minor formatting and text changes and kind of make sure that everything looks um, clean and perfect on the plan. So just some minor formatting stuff that we did as well. So those are the four key changes that we are proposing for the plan. And Alvin and I are both here to take questions after we hear from the public. Thank you, Lisa. With that, the hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you've not finished by the end of the three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your hand on the Zoom interface using the button that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. If you've joined by phone, you can dial star nine uh, to raise your hand. Are there any members of the public that would wish to testify at this time? We have one person with their hand raised so far and it's Andrea Shuaka. And I apologize for uh, mispronouncing anyone's name if you'll just correct me and I'll get it right next time. Not to worry about my name. Um, I am Andrea Shuaka. I am the chair of Transportation Solutions Arapahoe County, um, the LCC for Arapahoe County. And I really only have one suggestion, which I probably could have made separately, except I didn't remember where it was. I saw the need. Um, on page 40, you have a list of recognized organizations. And I would like to see the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council added somewhere to that page that they are contacted when things are happening otherwise known as Dr. Mack. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public care to comment this evening? All right, thank you everyone. <clears throat> so are there any questions from board members this evening for the public who commented? All right, thank you everyone. 
Seeing none, that brings our tonight's public hearing to a close. I thank you for your testimony and your interest. And that brings us to our next agenda item this evening, which is a report of the chair. And so for that, I will first turn it over to a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you very much. The Performance and Engagement Committee met on Wednesday, June 2nd, so a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had three informational briefings. One of those was a discussion of the 2021 board workshop agenda, which we've been working on with staff. Uh, that workshop is Friday and Saturday, August 27th and 28th. Uh, we are still finalizing the agenda with staff, but uh, that will be announced and, and we look forward to having hopefully everybody there that will be held locally in Denver at the Dr. Cog offices uh, is the plan again Saturday, uh, Friday, August 27th and Saturday, August 28th uh, should be a, a very, very impactful uh, time for all of us. We also had a discussion of the PE committee scheduled activities. This kind of provides a roadmap for the things that the committee does every year and, and plots those out. Uh, it's helpful to us now as we're working on it, but also something that will hopefully be helpful for the committee in years to come, uh, having that, that plotted out. And then finally, we had a uh, debriefing on the award ceremony that happened uh, a little while back. Uh, Amber Lieberman and Steve Erickson provided that briefing and it was incredibly helpful, uh, provided just lots of information about how the, the, the event went from staff perspective, members of people that attended uh, and some forward looking as we continue, uh, hopefully with in-person awards coming up uh, very soon. But uh, I wanna thank Amber and Steve for, for a very uh, helpful, debrief and obviously for the work they and other staff did on that event. And that is my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. And that takes us to a report from the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you very much. The Finance and Budget Committee has not met. We have a special meeting scheduled for June 24th at 12 noon. So I'll report out next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw. And that brings us to our executive director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Um, I would like to echo just a couple of comments were made for the, the, the uh, committee reports. First on the board workshop, um, thank you to Director Conklin for bringing that up. Um, please mark your calendars. We will be sending out a calendar, save the date here in the next few days. So we'll get it on your calendar, but we're really excited about the agenda starting to come together now. Um, there will be opportunities for the board to socialize with each other, which I know coming out of COVID, that, that's, uh, that's something truly to look forward to. And we'll be doing that on the building's patio, which they built uh, um, oh, a couple of years ago now, but it hasn't had much use because of COVID. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody in person. The other thing I would like to mention is, um, what Director Shaw mentioned about the Finance and Budget Committee being moved. I wanna thank the members of the Finance and Budget Committee for their flexibility and willingness to, to move that meeting. Um, we had a little bit of a uh, scheduling conflict. We have a couple action items that are coming out of the Advisory Committee on Aging or ACA that um, sometimes the ACA meeting works in the calendar for to take it directly to Finance and Budget and sometimes it doesn't. But this, and this is one of those times it didn't. So. We really do appreciate the flexibility. And that's one of the good things, I guess, about COVID. We were very familiar with virtual meetings now and, and we have the, uh, had the ability to, to uh, get these meetings rescheduled in a timely fashion. So thank you uh, for both of that. Um, I would like to mention two other things. Uh, in May, Governor Polis signed uh, House Bill 1117 into law. This bill, which was originally initiated by CML, was supported by Dr. Cog. Um, and it clarifies that local governments may regulate the development of land uh, and use of land within their jurisdictions in order to promote new development or redevelopment of affordable housing units. Um, at the request of many of our member of governments, Dr. Cog is convening a work group of local government staff um, interested in exploring and better understanding their community's readiness for inclusionary uh, housing ordinances. Um, we hosted the first meeting of the group yesterday and anticipate uh, four or more uh, meetings over the coming months. Um, we had 20 plus member governments join us yesterday and, and we look forward to supporting your staff as they learn more about housing policy options that work best in, in, um, in your respective communities. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Brad Calvert, Dr. Cobb's Director of Regional uh, Planning and Development, and we'll be sure to get you hooked up. 
The last thing I would like to mention this evening, um, you'll recall that, that at your April meeting, the board received a presentation by CDPHE staff about a pending rulemaking on a employer employee traffic reduction program or ETRP or ETRIP as some, some are calling it. Um, the rulemaking itself is scheduled to occur in August at the August meeting of the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, in anticipation of that rulemaking, Dr. Cog has filed for party status in order to stay abreast of the developments leading up to the rulemaking. Um, Dr. Cog has an obvious interest in this rulemaking since we run the Regional Transportation Demand Management Program. Um, you guys might know it as our way to go program. Um, the next step will be developing a pre-hearing statement, which is due on July 7th, so stay tuned and we will be providing additional information through the next couple of months. And with that, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you, Doug, and I'd like to thank Doug and, and the whole Dr. Cog team for following this so closely. Obviously, the eTrip program will be of great interest to the board, and so we looked at scheduling a special meeting to be able to give staff direction on the pre-hearing statement. But just given the timeline, it doesn't seem feasible. So we've asked the executive director to work with the executive committee members to craft the statement. We won't be taking a formal position on the proposed rule in the pre-hearing statement, but may raise questions about the components for exploration. Um, our board will likely want to take a position for the full hearing. So we will bring the discussion about eTrip to the full board for our July meeting. So please um, make sure that you're able to attend that. And if you can't, please send your alternate. And so that. Uh, takes us to our next agenda item, which is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is now allocated for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. I would request that there are no public comments on issues which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Are there any members of the public this evening that would like to address the Dr. Cog Board of Directors? Seeing none, that takes us to our consent agenda. Could I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Uh, thank you, and Director Shaw, would you like to second? I see you talking, but you're muted. I second the motion, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Director Shaw. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion of consent? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. That takes us to our informational briefings this evening. Our first briefing is on legislative updates. Rich Morrow, our senior policy and legislative analyst, will take us through that, and you'll find it in the packet listed under attachment E. All right. Hey, Rich. Hi there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to um, ask our lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle to begin, and then I will wrap up after they've had a few comments to make. Um, and I believe they are on, so. Um, I'm here, Rich. Good, all right, get us started. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. This is Ed Bowditch, contract lobbyist. Um, this year was um, unusual to say the least. We started off, we had, 20 some new legislators who were elected in, in November. Um, when the legislature convened in January, they met for three days um, just to do some cleanup work and some specific COVID relief work. Then they took a break until February 16th, came back into session and met until last Tuesday, June 8th. Um, a lot of the concern at the beginning of the session was with the state budget. Um, but it became pretty clear that the legislature, uh, on a positive note, really cut too much of the budget last spring. Revenues did not fall as much as everyone had anticipated. The good, that was good news. Um, the bad news was the service industry and many of the um, um, kind of the, the, the lower wage earners were the ones really hurting um, because of the economic, uh, the impact on the pandemic. Um, so it really was a, an uneven felt economic recession with the high wage earners not as affected as the low wage earners. Um, that led to the state wanting to do a number of state stimulus bills 
They passed about 10 state stimulus bills. This is one-time money that they tried to get to small businesses, arts organizations, tax relief, anything to really help out those people who'd been impacted by the, um, by the economic slowdown. Um, then we got more federal stimulus dollars. They really tried to prioritize those um, onto affordable housing, um, some monies for transportation, um, some other kind of stimulus bills for businesses as well. Um, the revenues came in very strong at the March revenue forecast. So people were very pleased with, uh, with where the economy is right now. Still a bit uneven across all the economic sectors, but if we can have a good tourism summer, um, that would really help the tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, the legislature did a couple of tax issues, um, did, uh, eliminated some tax credits and tax deductions. Um, primarily for businesses and wealthy, um, wealthy wage earners, wealthy individuals, and try and focus some of the, the tax um, benefits from that on the lower income individuals. Um, finally, they did some school finance tinkering that tries to correct an error um, that had reduced mill levy um, support for local school districts back in the early 2000s. Um, so that created a lot of interest um, the issue went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yes, you can fix this. So that is being fixed. But really it was a lot about trying to address the uh, stimulus programs, both the state stimulus dollars and the federal stimulus dollars. Um, the, one of the big issues they did, I'll turn it over to my partner, Jennifer Castle, was a big transportation bill and I'll kick it over to her at this point. Thank you, Ed, I appreciate that. So. As expected a little bit, um, the 2021 legislative session was um, big on transportation. Um, there were three major bills that were passed that had to do with transportation issues. I'll speak very briefly on two of those before I get into the, the, the major transportation bill. Um, we did see an RTD accountability bill um, that was introduced from the RTD accountability subcommittee or the committee um, of which Dr. Cog hosted that committee, various administrative changes, some transparency issues as it related to services and fares. Um, but we have, we have been told, and that bill did pass. We have been told that that is going to be the only bill that's coming out of the RTD Accountability Committee. Um, so I don't know if, if future RTD issues will be looked at in, in future legislatures. We did also see Senate Bill 238, which was the Front Range Rail Bill um, that essentially allowed the state to go ahead and create the Front Range Rail District um, in hopes of being able to bring down some federal dollars um, from Amtrak. So hopefully Colorado could, could see those federal dollars come in. Of course, a lot of details still remain on exactly what's going to you know, happen within the Front Range Rail District, who will be members, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of eyes on that. And then as Ed alluded to, the big transportation bill this year, um, Senate Bill 260, so after many months and weeks of anticipation and stakeholdering, we finally saw Senate Bill 260 introduced, oh gosh, what, late, late April, I believe. Um, and it was really, I think most of us knew what was going to be in the bill and that was, that, and our you know, suspicions were confirmed once we saw the bill. Essentially a variety of fees on fuels, on car types, um, there was a, there's now a dedicated funding source from the state that will go to transportation and then a lot of enterprise funds that were set up to help promote electrification of vehicles, multimodal traveling projects, um, and certain other highway and, and bridge projects as well, too. And um, the bill was amended in the second chamber that did have an impact on Dr. Cog specifically um, as it related to our, our planning. And um, it, it essentially would have, I guess, required us to go back into planning. We just finished our tip. We would have had to go back into that planning here in a couple of months and essentially redo everything. Um, we did have conversations with the bill sponsor, sponsors, I should say, excuse me, um, and, and, and some, some folks, uh, some various other stakeholders on that. And we were able to get a little bit of movement on that and, and extend some deadlines, um, which, which ultimately in the end was, was good. I, I will say the major substance that is in the bill didn't really change as the bill went through the legislative process. It was 
very heavily focused on, on the environment and on electrification of vehicles, as I mentioned, and, and finding transit options and, and not necessarily expanding highways and building new highways, um, but really took more of, a, of a, an approach um, that, that pleased a lot of, a lot of folks um, that, ha that, that have environmental concerns as it relates to building you know, more roads and bridges and emissions and, and that kind of thing. So um, in the end, it, it passed both chambers after many hours of testimony. Um, as I mentioned, many stakeholders were involved um, in this bill and it was pitched, um, I think in his closing remarks from the, the Speaker of the House, Alec Garnett, you know, mentioned how <clears throat> there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into this proposal. And at the end of the day, it's, it's the most substantial transportation sustainability funding bill that we've seen in, gosh, many years. So a lot of, a lot of folks were happy to see this passed. Um, and I, I imagine we'll continue to have a lot of conversations with this as, as, we, as we move forward. And with that, I know Rich has a lot to mention as it relates to some of the aging bills that we followed, because a lot happened in aging as well, too. So, Rich. Rich, you're on mute. Be careful. I was trying to be careful there. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Jen. And uh, I'll, I'll be a little, I won't be too long, but uh, I will note that uh, uh, all of the, the aging bills, I think actually all of the bills that we supported passed this year. Um, but I, I wanna highlight two of the aging bills um, after first talking about um, the uh, long bill budget process. Uh, and we had talked, I think with this about the, to the board before, uh, but we were pleased to be able to get the um, state funding for senior services line item in the long bill, which is the main state funding source for the area agencies on aging, um, let's say stabilized or returned to um, its levels uh, back in 2019 before the pandemic. And it took a lot, took a lot of work uh, leading, you know, last, last summer and fall leading up to uh, the budget process and um, uh, certainly Ed and, Ed and Jen really helped out a lot with that process and with the uh, governor's office and with particularly, especially with the joint budget committee. So we were glad that that was, that turned out well. Um, we also uh, actually ended up spending uh, a fair amount of time toward the end of the session on Senate Bill 158 was a bill, and again, we've mentioned before that provides um, a loan repayment program to incentivize advanced practice providers, uh, nurses uh, and uh, physicians assistants to get specialties in geriatric care. Uh, there's, there's a dramatic uh, shortage of healthcare providers in this state that have specialties in geriatric care compared to the, the large number of older and growing number of older adults in this state. And so this bill um, would provide a, um, a program through CDPHE to uh, help with uh, school loan repayments to incentivize that. And we, the bill ran into some problems late in the process in terms of its funding. And um, uh, again, Jen and Ed helped uh, a lot with uh, Help, with us helping the uh, sponsors navigate through the funding process and that ultimately got done and passed. So we're happy to see that. And, and, the, and the last one that, that I really wanna um, talk about and am, am really pleased to be able to report was a bill that we never actually got a chance to present to you because it was introduced um, after the, uh, the May board meeting and it's Senate Bill 290. It is listed in your um, in your packet in the matrix as I think no position. Um, but that this is a bill that uh, we were able to work on with uh, um, our House and Senate sponsors, who I also want to give a lot of credit to uh, Senators Danielson and Buckner and Representatives uh, Young and Bradfield for uh, being champions of this issue. And basically uh, sort of coming on the heels of these stimulus bills that Ed was talking about, uh, this bill uh, provides $15 million 
Uh, actually, it ends up being from general fund, not from federal funds, but it provides $15 million into a cash fund to provide for grants to area agencies on aging to, throughout the state to address uh, various uh, infrastructure and other capital needs that they may have. Um, and so we were really pleased to be able to get that done uh, during the last uh, few weeks of the legislative session. Um, and with that, uh, I think we, um, I was gonna mention briefly and see if Ed and Jen wanted to pipe in a little bit um, looking forward to the, set, uh, to the next session, to the summer and the next session. Uh, as I understand it, and others can correct me or, or give more detail, but with all the, the flurry of activity at the last session or at the end of the session uh, with the federal ARPA funds, uh, they still have basically spent uh, about half of that money. There's still a couple, almost a couple billion dollars left, I believe, that they haven't spent yet. And so at least what I've heard is that they're planning on some sort of interim committee process to uh, work through uh, and identify priorities and uh, possible other uh, funding uh, projects and so forth, uh, proposals that then would be introduced as legislation in the next session. And so we're planning to pay a lot of attention to those activities and look for opportunities uh, on behalf of, of Dr. Cog. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll see if Jen and Ed have anything else to add on that and open it up to any other comments or questions from the board. Oh, that's it, Rich. Yep, thank you, thank you Rich. Yep. Thank you to Rich, Ed, and Jen. It's really impressive that all of the bills that we took a position on that you guys were able to make progress on those and get those across the line. That's really very impressive. And the way that you conduct your business and represent us is, is greatly appreciated by the board. So thank you so much. Any directors have questions or comments um, for the group? Director Levy. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, isn't on the agenda itself, but Senate Bill 238 does create an opportunity for Dr. Cog to designate or nominate, I guess it would be the process directors to the Front Range Passenger Rail Special District. So uh, at uh, sometime in the very near future, we ought to have a conversation about how we're going to make those appointments uh, and um, maybe there ought to be a, a committee um, of Dr. Cog to talk about that process. I, I don't recall offhand when those nominations are due, uh, but um, the bill just designates um, you know, geographic areas and MPOs that are authorized to make those appointments. It doesn't have any detail on how those appointments should be made. So I just wanted to raise that issue. Thank you, Director Levy, and I'll let Executive Director Rex expand on this, but we typically we have a nominating committee that the board seats for a year's time. And the nominating committee typically takes applications for any kind of openings, whether it's the executive committee or subcommittees. So we might consider using the process that we already have in place, but the board may want to make a separate process for this. Executive Director Rex, did you want to expand on that? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, that's that's a pretty good idea. Um, I will tell you that we plan on seeking some clarity um, about what the process might be with regards to making those appointments and what our role obviously is. We we understand that we're we're to make recommendations associated with. So um, yeah, so so give us give us a couple of weeks so we can figure all that out and uh, and we'll get back with you in time for the next meeting. Then we can develop uh, a a process to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Director Venom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, on uh, June the 8th at about 8 p.m., or a few minutes before 8 p.m., the House passed 1266. And uh, with the passage of that, there were some uh, extremely unhappy people um, who claimed that the passage of 1266 was a violation of the uh, state constitution because the matter had never been read to the House. And I wonder if, uh, if the three of you could uh, enlighten us or enlighten, at least enlighten me on uh, the goings on with uh, 1266. 
Thank you, Director Venom. And I'll, Rich, I'll let you decide who can take that question. Yeah, I think this is one time I might defer to my lobbyists. <laughs> um, so House Bill 1266. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. And you might... <laughs> Jen, it sounds like Ed has this one. I I was about to introduce it and then kick it to Jen, but no, I'll oh, perfect. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give the, the brief summary that I know. So House Bill 1266 was concerning environmental justice for disproportionately impacted communities. And that bill um, was passed by the House um, earlier in the session, went over to the Senate and then came back for House concurrence to Senate amendments. There were, there were a few other um, uh, amendments that were adopted on the Senate side that were added and that House members felt, some House members felt like they didn't have time, they didn't have printed copies. They requested the bill be read at length. Um, there were all sorts of parliamentary maneuvers and certainly former Representative Levy and former Representative and Senator Andy Kerr can remember some of those parliamentary maneuvers. Sometimes people would raise to speed up a session or slow down a session, but I guess I, I don't really have an opinion about the path that that took and whether it violated the Constitution. That is for someone to file a, an official lawsuit and that's for the courts to decide. I've seen bills pass much faster than that one, and I've seen bills slow way down as well. And I'm sorry I can't be more specific about, about that, that particular path that, that bill took, but it did generate a lot of debate. Director Venom, does that answer your question? Yes. I, I apologize, yes. this is yes. for the only thing that I would add to... Go ahead, Jen. Okay, good. apologies. Um, that bill, we also got word within what the last week or so of the legislative session that that was going to be the pro environment bill that the Democratic majority was going to pass instead of passing Senate Bill 200, which would have codified um, some of the greenhouse gas reduction goals into state statutes. Um, so 1266 quickly became the avenue that the, the, uh, the pro-environment stakeholders were pushing. Um, and, and again, as Ed mentioned, this was something that happened, of course, very last minute. Um, it, it does do a couple of things, uh, including disproportion, disproportionate um, communities to be brought into the process of AQCC rulemaking. It does allow certain fines to be given for, greenhouse, for, not, for not meeting greenhouse gas reductions, those types of things. But but I would wholeheartedly agree with what Ed said um, about folks being a little bit upset about this and a lot of debate and some, some angst around this bill um, as well too. So just wanted to add a, a little bit more flavor to that. Thank you, Jen. And then Director Venom, does that now answer your question? Yes, that's uh, outstanding information. Thank you. Next up, we have Director Seitz. Thanks, sorry, took a moment to unmute there. Um, wanna thank uh, Director Levy for asking one of my questions. Um, can you remind me though, just as a follow-up to her question, um, who is on the nominating committee right now? Executive Director Rex, do you have that handy? Oh, wow, I do. Uh, <laughs> or you could email um, it to us at some point. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I can definitely do that. I, okay, thank you. Um, and then I do have um, a question on two of the transportation bills that were presented earlier. Um, on 1186, um, I do believe that the accountability committee is going to be wrapping up in July. And I want to make sure I understand. I know 1186 was kind of from the early recommendations. Will it encapsulate those that final report? Um, and then will Dr. Cog be monitoring or... Um, I guess watching or involved at all with RTD's implementation of those recommendations? And if so, how are they gonna do that? And Rich, I'll turn it over to you to determine who to answer the question. Yeah, I think that's more of uh, on the implementation side, right? Not the, the legislative side, that's my initial response. So it's probably 
I, I guess maybe uh, what I would say. I, I would agree with that, Rich. Yeah, it mm -hmm. needs some sort of some internal discussions about how we might follow up now that the bill's passed. So I think I heard um, Ms. Castle mention that there doesn't appeal there'll be, appear there'll be additional legislation coming from the accountability committee. Is that what I heard? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So I, guess, and yes. I guess that is my question. I feel like it's a little bit legislative, like so that we're going to have a final report at the end of July. What will happen with those recommendations? We don't we don't see a legislative avenue for that. Or is that already um, is it does this bill, I guess, already kind of dictate how those will be adopted? Thank you, Director Seitz. I was told on Monday that um, there are no plans for any further legislation to be introduced from that committee. Um, so I believe that the report that's going to come out in July, um, I imagine it, it, it may have future recommendations for legislation, but I just know that the committee does not have any plans on making any future recommendations for legislation um, for okay, next session. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, it looks like, just one second, uh, Director Seitz, it looks like Executive Director Rex would like to add on to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, thank you for the question. Yes, I, I, I think I think Jennifer answered it fairly well. It, it you know, the um, there was an opportune time with regards to the uh, the work of the accountability committee to get something quickly over to the legislature that we all felt, including RTD, were were um, were items um, that you know that there was mutual acceptance that that if we could get these these this bill passed, that there would be mutual benefit. Now, um, as you know, Dr. Cog's staff is facilitating the RTD Accountability Committee work, and we're in the process of wrapping up the recommendations of, of that committee. When the report itself, the final report, should be available after the July 12th meeting of that group. Um, we do anticipate that some of those recommendations may lead to future uh, legislation, although we know that for a fact, but it will, it, it, it will be to anything uh, in the recommendations will be taken up in the next legislative session. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. And then if if it's okay with the chair, I did have um, just a quick um, refresher question on 260. It's absolutely fine, but it looked like um, Ed may have also wanted to add something in. I saw him raising his hand. So if we could, if he could just finish. Oh, of course, the of previous, course. Yes, and then we'll come back to you. Sure, and I, I would say, um, any anything that comes out in that final report could be carried just by a, a, a legislator who is interested in RTD. And we see RTD bills or bills that affect RTD almost every session. It's also important to put it to remember the timeline of the RTD kind of oversight. There was a lot of concern about RTD um, and, and the legislature really wanting to create this oversight committee um, in January and February of 2000 and lots of people came to the Capitol and then COVID hit and then nobody was riding RTD and they had huge financial problems and then they get a new director. So I think some people feel like RTD, we need to get them on a path mm -hmm. to financial sustainability and give the new executive director a chance as well. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. Thank you, Director Seitz, back to you. Thank you, and I think those are fair points. Um, I just, on 260, I know we have been briefed as this body on this before, but could you remind me um, when CDOT will provide information regarding um, the um, Highway Users Trust Fund um, and how it'll be allocated, the amount the Highway Users Trust Fund will be allocated to local governments? Well, um, I'm not the right person, I'm not sure the right person to turn it over to uh, on that, but I know that there is a draft uh, spreadsheet that CDOT has put out uh, on that. And so we can get that over to members. Thank you. It is a draft just so people don't take the money to the bank and start spending. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Is it, would any of the, of the staff members like to add anything to that? Okay. We'll get that out. I, I probably everybody would be interested in seeing that. So we'll circulate that to the group. All right. Are there any other questions from members? All right. Seeing none, that takes us to our next order of business this evening. Yeah, oh, Rich, Can yes, I just please. Mention one last thing for you. Yes, sir. Uh, I just be I just 
I had just become aware, and, and maybe the rest of you had seen the announcement too, but apparently uh, the, the transportation bill 260 is going to be signed by the governor tomorrow. There will be a signing ceremony tomorrow. So if you haven't received uh, your notices, I'm sure you, you'll all be getting them <laughs> if you're on the right email lists. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. We'll all look forward to that. And that brings us to our next order of business, which is a briefing on potential performance measures and target amendments to Metro Vision. Andy Taylor, our regional planning manager is going to take us through this. Andy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Board. I appreciate your time and uh, attention on this agenda item as uh, we continue this conversation about potential Metro Vision amendments. Uh, we've been working our way through the strategic framework of MetroVision since February, mostly at board work sessions. And today we're here to focus on potential changes to the plan's performance measures. Uh, before we jump back into the strategic planning framework or model behind MetroVision, I wanted to pause and remind everyone about who the plan relies on. Uh, MetroVision doesn't have to be small. It's not just about the actions or power of Dr. Cog. It's comprehensive and it reflects so much of what all these other partners are already doing to meet these shared aspirations. It's all levels of government, local, state, federal, business community, and many other organizations. And so I've shown this slide a lot uh, as we've proceeded through this discussion, just as a reminder of how MetroVision is structured. It follows the same strategic framework that Dr. Cog uses as an organization. We even share those top two levels, mission and vision, and we've been uh, working on discussing some potential staff initiated proposed changes um, at, and so far we've made it through the outcome and objective levels. Uh, and so these proposals have been focused on how other state or regional efforts since MetroVision's passage in 2017 could be reflected. Uh, and the regional transportation plan uh, is one of those very recent efforts that that sparked some of this change uh, and proposals. Uh, we're now at the level uh, of workshopping uh, our staff initiated proposals. Uh, for measure and target changes, but we wanted to make sure to get some uh, feedback before advancing uh, 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 further with, with uh, our staff proposals. Um, MetroVision is a, a, a team sport. It involves uh, the, the actions and activities of many partners. Uh, measures are just a way of tracking progress toward desired outcomes that are in the plan. They're regional collective measures. They're not intended to judge individual projects or places. Each individual actor or partner uh, is going to be contributing at different rates and different speeds, all depending on their position. Uh, but it's about what the work collectively means. Uh, we do have some criteria for what we can consider as a MetroVision measure uh, from the plan itself. Uh, relevance to the plan outcomes is usually not the breaking point. Uh, we have more topics covered in the plan than we can directly measure with individual measures. Uh, data availability is one of the biggest issues that can make or break what might otherwise be an ideal measure. And additionally, we have other ways to feature anecdotal success or achievements through metrovision.cog.org, uh, but not necessarily as measures. Uh, and just because something is quantitative doesn't mean we should automatically make it a measure. Uh, Dr. Cog issues other reports, studies, and data briefs that can help tell the story about progress towards MetroVision. Uh, this is something we recognized uh, in the plan itself. Uh, sometimes we may only get a one-time or a fairly infrequent data set. Other times we may be evaluating a fairly new data set and might want to see if it, it proves to be regular and reliable. Uh, so with the remaining slides, I just want to share with you staff's proposed direction on measure changes as part of this package of amendments. We're here seeking feedback before we come back with a full set of staff proposed revisions to MetroVision. We've grouped the measures as much as possible so we can focus on the areas where feedback might be most helpful. And I apologize if the order feels a little choppy, but we tried our best to go down the list of measures to give you the full picture as well. Um, so here we're not proposing any changes to the measures around growth and development. Uh, the only change you're likely to see is as we bring our targets out to 2050 uh, to align with the new planning horizon year uh, that the Metro Vision uh, Regional Transportation Plan uh, you recent ado recently adopted what that established. Uh, on the topic of transportation, I've got a few slides that follow uh, that outline some of staff's proposed changes, uh, which so, will Andy, also, yes. 
I apologize for interrupting. I think it would be best if we can take questions as we go sure. through with, while we have the slide up. And it looks like Director Levy has a question or comment to start us off. So it may be on the previous slide. Director Levy? Oh, yes, thank you. And actually, I did have a question as to how we were going to do questions and comments, but I do have a, a question on the previous slide and it may apply. Uh, yeah, the growth and development slide, it may apply to others as well. And I was really specifically interested in um, the 2040 targets and, you know, what's going to be projected out and just how you arrived at those numbers. Are they, um, you know, the 25% and whatever you propose to increase it to? It, it, does that rep represent something, um, something empirical in some way, something objective? Um, is there, uh, you know, what are, what are we getting at? Uh, so there were, um, uh, thanks for that question, there were a lot of discussions when we were discussing, when we were talking about these measures specifically back in uh, 2017 when it was adopted and, and prior to that, um, a lot of that was carryover uh, of, for some of these measures that were there uh, in some form in the previous MetroVision plan, MetroVision 2035, uh, so there was some rationale that carried over from that. Uh, there was some scenario work that went into um, MetroVision that was done back in 2013 that helped us identify some of these, these, these targets themselves. And so it was a longer discussion at that point in time about setting these 2040 targets. In, in terms of the 2050 targets, uh, we're going to take a close look at the small area forecast that we recently completed and also try and see is this, for all of these, is this something we would want to extend a trajectory out to or is this an item that, that we are going to propose, maybe it, we meet this target and we hold steady to 2050. And so it'll just vary measure by measure. Um, I don't know if that addresses the question. Well, sort of, and I, I realize I actually didn't ask my question very well. Um, you know, when we're looking at what percent of housing is um, and employment are located in urban centers, are we, we're wanting to increase that percentage presumably for a reason um, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the cost of transit, you know, any number of reasons. And I don't know whether that 25% or whatever it projects out to in 2050 reflects some other thing we're trying to achieve. And we think that's the right number to get there or whether it's just a question of, well, 10% is good, 25% would be better. You know, I'm trying to understand whether that target reflects some other goal, some other metric we're trying to achieve. There was some- And, and likewise, excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. I should just, yeah. you know, with the, with the population density, is 25 a 25% increase or whatever that turns out to be, is there some reason why that is a good density, <laughs> you know, or do we just think dense is better and so more dense is even more better, you know, that's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, so for the, the urban centers one specifically, um, this was a carryover from MetroVision 2035. There had been a, a goal related to um, new housing and new employment to be located in, uh, in urban centers. And this was trying to transition that to something that's easier to track because it's, it's harder to track what's new employment uh, versus um, uh, just a, a job is easier to measure in that data set. So that was part of the rationale for making that transition. Um, and some of this is anchored back to some scenario work that we again repeated last year, that these urban centers are areas where uh, we want to focus uh, a growth because they're areas that perform better in terms of vehicle miles traveled and, and subsequent emissions that they're connected to some of these other areas as well. Uh, density is similar to that, uh, that, that we want to grow more in areas that are already well settled. We have some objectives and, and, and uh, related to um, seeing more growth in, in, in areas that need redevelopment and so uh, an infill and so that's that's a reflection of some of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Director Levy, did you have more to follow on with that? 
Mm, I, I don't think so. No, I mean, I understand the value that we're trying to achieve. I'm just trying to understand the basis for the numerical target. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Director Mulvey. Yes, thank you. Um, my question has to do with the measures um, and the data sets that are used to measures and obviously understanding that we're looking at 2050. But we have um, several areas, particularly in my region, Douglas County, that are experiencing tremendous growth that's not yet measured in a census and is going to increase over time, 10 year, 15 year ranges. So again, understand, I know this is 2050, but how do we account for in these measures, the data at those changes that may or may not be reflected in traditional census data? Um, how do we, so some of the data that we use, we're looking at, um, uh, we, we collect a lot of housing data from, we do an annual call for data uh, from local governments and compile it from other sources as well, such as county assessors, um, and as well as employment data. So we're collecting a lot of what we consider to be point level data. So we're trying to get at that other than just census data um, to try and get a, as best accuracy as we can in terms of Things like urban centers, those are areas that have been locally identified and then regionally designated through uh, MetroVision uh, rewrite or amendment. Um, so there's things like that as well. Um, so uh, in terms of the data sources, I, I've got some documentation as well about all the data sources that we currently use, um, if that would be helpful to um, include somewhere. And Andy, just while you're on that point, it's a, it's a really good time to remind directors that when we do, when staff does that call for local data, sometimes our local staff don't do a good job of getting back to Dr. Cog staff. So they always email the board of directors to kind of get our help reminding everybody, because it's really important that our local staffs provide our local information back to Dr. Cog staff when they ask for it. So they do have the most up-to-date information. Thank you. That's helpful. I would. It's probably a better um, receipt of that data list on online for me. But I would appreciate receiving it so that you know we can be tuned into receiving that. And you know, I appreciate that it's done annually. That makes a big difference for us. Thank That's you. That's great. That's great. And if any other folks would want Andy uh, and Brad to follow up with that data, just send an email over and you'll find their contact info in the packet on this agenda item. So we'll get that over to Deborah and anybody else who requests it as well. Any other questions um, on this slide or to this point? All right, Andy, if you want to go to the next slide for us. All right. And uh, so with uh, transportation, um, I've got a few slides that follow here. Um, that outlines some of staff's proposed changes. Many of these were, were noted actually in chapter four of the recently uh, adopted uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, this is one where the board has had a few opportunities to, to discuss uh, proposals already. Um, and so based on previous discussions, the, the taking action on Regional Vision Zero and the Regional Transportation Plan, uh, staff ha has received enough direction that they're putting forward. Uh, we're putting forward uh, zero fatalities by 2040 and zero serious injuries by 2045. Uh, congestion, I'll slow down a little bit more here uh, because we've got a couple slides as we're proposing changing our direction a bit on congestion measures. Right now we've got two on the topic and we're thinking uh, we could go down to one and change its focus just a bit. Uh, staff workshop these ideas with May, in May with TAC. Uh, the shared theme here is to focus on a network related measure. Uh, what's the impact of congestion on the transportation network that we all have to plan our lives around? Uh, so this is a place where we could benefit some, from some feedback. As staff continues uh, and we're planning to go back to TAC yet this month, just discuss uh, technical implementation of one of these options. Uh, the options so far are changing the travel time variation measure that we currently use uh, to be a percentage, it reflect a percentage instead of a ratio like it does now, uh, potentially looking at the role of congestion to traffic outside the AM and PM uh, commute related peaks, uh, looking at the portion of the network that has congestion extending beyond those, beyond those peaks, or looking at the impact of that extended congestion time on uh, travel time. And so some of the other uh, items that were brought up were 
potentially derivatives of our uh, annual congestion report uh, that were discussed uh, at TAC. So that's where we are with um, some of our thinking there right now. And similarly with, with active transportation, this is another area that we've been workshopping with TAC since May. Uh, right now, we do not have a measure related to active transportation. Uh, the closest we come right now is to the modes of travel people choose for their commute, uh, which would, is proposed to stay. Um, but again, the theme here is around network. Are we completing the network identified in Dr. Cog's adopted active transportation plan? Or are we creating a network that has a larger share of high comfort facilities that may be more welcoming uh, to a broader range of users? Uh, TAC brought up some other items that might be more difficult to measure, which might be part of our ongoing conversation uh, later this month. All right, we'll pause right there for just one moment and Director Brackett, let us know what you think. Yeah, so thanks Thanks for that. A question for you. Um, I see you've got two options here, but then TAC came up with some different thoughts. Are we stuck with just one measure here or is there openness to having multiple, uh, multiple measures in this area? Um, we're definitely not stuck with one measure. Um, we try and keep things simple. We already have, uh, I think about 16 measures on the plan and reporting on them is already a lot of information at once. Uh, but um, we're happy that if we think it needs um, some of that additional nuance, uh, we've had more than one in a given area before. And so um, we're, we're definitely open to having that conversation. Great, and is this an appropriate time to give a comment as well as a question? Please do. So, well, I'll, I'll just, um, I mean, I'm really glad to see that we're adding um, some things around active transportation. Uh, I just, I think it's important to measure that high comfort uh, share of facilities um, because there are so many users that wouldn't use a lower comfort share and also they don't help us as much to get to our vision zero goals. Um, while at the same time, it's probably valuable to, to see what percent of our uh, total uh, active transportation plan has been realized in edit in at least some level. So I'll just say, I think we could benefit from having um, some of both to, to track as we go forward. Thank you, Director Brackett. Director Levy. Okay, it always takes me a while to get my mouse synced up with the screen I'm on. Um, thank you. Um, on the previous slide on congestion, um, I, you know, you, you, uh, you kind of change what you measure. And I'm wondering, since it looks like the, the options for other ways of, of measuring congestion all have to do with um, ways to get traffic spread out maybe over different across off peak times or, um, you know, how long the period of congestion is. And I'm wondering whether you considered a way to um, measure congestion in terms of whether there are alternative, the, the percentage of, of congested areas for which there is an alternative means of travel, um, whether there's a, a hot lane or uh, whether there's a transit route on it, um, you know, so that we don't just look in terms of trying to um, reduce congestion, but we look at ways to avoid congestion. I think a similar comment came up uh, at TAC, so that's definitely something that's on their mind um, that, that we can consider as well. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for this feedback. So staff is no noting down all the feedback that we're giving and we'll be able to incorporate our different perspectives uh, when they bring us more information for us to ultimately adopt. Director Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also like um, what, how we're measuring in a way that takes into account the experience of the people here. Um, it's not just numbers, but it is you know, how often do you experience congestion? Is there an alternative? And for active transportation, the comfort level of uh, the the option there. So thank you. These are these are good ideas. Thank you, Director Shaw. All right, I think we're ready to move on. 
Uh, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we're in a bit of an awkward spot. We have the state's legislation on targets and the roadmap on greenhouse gas, but we're still waiting from uh, rulemaking uh, that you heard about a little bit earlier uh, that should give us a clearer sense of the budgets that might be involved. And so you're likely to have other opportunities to discuss this and provide more in direct input or guidance on that rulemaking in the coming months. And so uh, this is something that we're holding off from tackling this cycle. And Andy, could you just elaborate a little bit on that? So you think once the rulemaking is done, we would make an amendment at that time once we understand what the target is? Yes, we we have been in the, the uh, cycle of amending every year. Sometimes they're more significant than others. So this one's more substantial, I guess, than, than we have uh, uh, in past years. But it's definitely something that we regularly and routinely try to do. And so uh, we feel like it's we've waited a long time for some of these other things related to uh, Vision Zero, and we want to just make sure we can jump on some of these other ones. And so we would uh, wait on this for a future cycle. Thank you, Director Brockett. And to drill into that a little bit more, are, are you proposing not changing the target or I'm sorry, the um, not changing it or removing it? Um, so we would leave it as is for now. Um, and then we would re revisit this once we have a better idea of what the impact of the specific policies and rulemaking would be. Uh, so this would stay as is for now. Great. And then when you say um, not this cycle, it, it, just to get a little bit more clarity on, on your answer uh, to Director Stolzman, to Chair Stolzman, um, would, would that be an annual cycle? Then? That, uh, yes, we didn't do an amendment last year. Uh, this last year because uh, we were in the middle of the regional transportation plan update, but previously we've been amending every year. Got it. So it, it seems like waiting one year uh, might might not be the end of the world, but I just would want to make sure that we got back to this next year because uh, we, like you say, we don't do it every year, um, but by this time next year, we should know what those targets are. So I just want to make sure that we stay on top of the, this and incorporate those revisions as soon as we are able to. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Sykes? I guess I keep going back and forth. I, I wanted to know, um, in 2019, there was some pretty historic land um, climate legislation that was passed, including um, greenhouse gas reduction goals. And I noticed this was passed in May of 2019. Did it already contemplate meeting those um, articulated state goals. I, I mean, I recognize, um, you know, 1266 is, is putting more weight behind them, but those were already articulated to some degree. Um, does this already reflect that? Uh, this one as written was part of what was adopted first in January, 2017. It, this specific line itself hasn't been amended since then. So uh, there are a couple measures that have been were amended since January 2017, but this would not reflect uh, the, the, that 2019 legislation. Thank you, and that looks like that answered your question, Director Sites. I just was pausing for a minute. Um, I'm gonna just as a point of order, um, just so everyone remembers. And it's usually easy to understand this when we're in person, um, but at the work session meetings, we have members and alternates all sit at the table together and participate in complete discussion. And at uh, board meetings, we just have one member from each jurisdiction sit at the table. And so when we're doing it in this virtual forum, we have one member from each jurisdiction as a panelist and some of the jurisdiction jurisdictions have their alternates here as well and they're absolutely welcome and they're just in the attendee section so we can only have one person at the board meeting so that we only have one member voting so just a, a point of order as a reminder to folks of why their alternate might not be listed as a panelist but they are still absolutely welcome um, at the meeting and we value everybody's participation andy would you like to continue on for us yes um Again, we're in another awkward spot here in relation to a proposed measure related to transit service quality. This was a need identified as part of the regional transportation plan. Uh, we've identified for the need for this measure, but RTE is in the middle of their reimagined mobility planning effort. Um, and so just as with GHG, you're likely to actually have other opportunities to provide more direct input and guidance on that plan. And so again, we're proposing to wait um, until we have a better sense of what types of metrics that might come out of that process that we could also uh, incorporate here in, in MetroVision. 
Thank you. Um, I've got a couple slides to dwell on this staff proposed change because we're proposing the removal of a measure. We're proposing to remove uh, the housing and transportation costs related measure due to lack of consistent data. Uh, transportation cost data is expensive to come by and just hard to come by and not regularly surveyed. Um, uh, TAC expressed some of the same concerns that I imagine some of you might have that this concept remains important. Uh, equity and affordability uh, were mentioned during that session uh, that when we discussed this with TAC and introduced this removal, uh, staff's proposed direction is to instead add two measures, one directly related to housing uh, that I've got a couple slides on as well, and another related to inclusion that I'll talk about alongside other measures related to economic vitality. Uh, so our proposed measure for housing quality and security relies on data from uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development that they regularly compile from Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Uh, they tally the number of, of occupied units that have one or more severe problems, which they define as incomplete kitchens, incomplete plumbing, more than 1.5 persons per room, which is not bedrooms, but actually all rooms, um, or the presence of a household who is spending more than 50% of their income on housing. And so here we're talking about uh, nearly 200,000 occupied units uh, in our region that, that would uh, be under this measure in, in the, with the most recent available data. So that would be a, a baseline type number. Um, I apologize for the order here before we get to the proposal related uh, to inclusion. Uh, the, the Forest Service out of CSU has updated their analysis of wildfire threats. Uh, which will also require a new baseline uh, since they used a different methodology in addition to updated data uh, and so that'll probably also trigger some changes related to uh, a potential 2050 target as well so um, we, we've been crunching the numbers on that with the, the new geographies that they've put out thank you andy uh, director levy yes um thank you and and going back to the um the the housing and transportation cost removal. I'm sorry, took me a sec to um, compose my thoughts on this. Um, I, I guess I'm concerned about removing this because I feel that that um, the equity issue and just the the housing affordability it um, as uh, you know looking at severe cost burden really doesn't quite get at what the housing and transportation uh, issue gets at. Um, when you look at housing and transportation together, you're looking at folks being pushed farther and farther out in order to find affordability. And while they may meet affordability uh, criteria with respect to a percentage of their income on housing, when you add that to their transportation costs, um, you you know you're pushing them back into into that tenuous position, and um, and so I think we're we're not going to be getting the full uh, picture on affordability if we take this out. And um, you're um, so that I, I guess I'm wondering about the kinds of data that might be available. I have seen in previous work I did many years ago, I've seen numbers on this. I don't know where the data came from, so I can't say that it's available or that you would consider it to be good data. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering about um, the kinds of data that you would, that you're looking for or that you considered. So we've been relying on the uh, data set that the, the Center for Neighborhood Technology puts out. They're a group out of Chicago. Um, they have a model that they use to estimate uh, transportation costs um, at, at a pretty, I think it's usually a census tract or block group level. Um, they rely on other data sets to create um, that model and, and estimate those numbers. And they're, they're subject to change that model periodically. But the biggest problem we have with using that data is we have an observation using 2013-related uh, 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 data, and we have a second one using uh, data that's from 2015 that they put out uh, in 2017, and they have not updated those numbers since then. So we'll be putting out um, uh, our annual performance measure status report. We have for several years 
been missing something to report on for this measure? Well, Director, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. I guess I'm just wondering if there's another way. Um, it sounds like maybe there is a, I guess the data is there. It's just not updated regularly enough because I do think that the cost of housing by itself is not really going to tell us about affordability. And I, I guess that's, I, I guess I don't have another suggestion on this. Yeah, it, it's just something that's not regularly surveyed. Um, the consumer expenditure survey that the, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out um, does not have a sufficient sample size to really say anything definitive about our our region, uh, let alone uh, some smaller areas that might get at this dynamic between housing and transportation costs. That's the only other place that I know of that does that type of uh, data collection. Thank you. Director Marlin? Uh, thank you. And at building on <clears throat> Director Levy's comments. Um, just my opinion, to the extent that cost is the issue, I, I think it's probably worth it to include transportation costs and keep this measure. Um, and I wonder, maybe looking forward, could the eTrip program provide that data in the future? I know that it seems like they would need some data like this to run that program. Thank you, Director Merlin. Director Teal. Well, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna back up uh, 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 Director Levy on this one in that I'd be okay to hear um, uh, uh, further analysis, exploring other data sets in order to measure this transportation, um, you know, housing, uh, housing versus transportation cost question. I mean, this, when this was first, adopted back in the EMBIC days, I believe the chair will recall. I mean, this was a, a, a very heavily talked about topic because of questions of the reliability of the data, of uh, availability of the data, perhaps. And so, I mean, I'm okay doing another exploration of where the data set is uh, that could be used, um, but then you know, based upon that analysis and, and discussion at the board level, um, then moving forward um, with either retaining this as a, um, a MetroVision measure or actually following staff's guidance. Um, just because, you know, again, I recall those conversations very clearly. And there was always a problem with where that data, could that data be reliable? Could it be counted upon? Uh, year over year. So I'm okay with further discussion on the nature of the data. Maybe we can find uh, a better data set that can help us uh, nail down the transportation cost piece. But then um, if that's not the case, then um, definitely following staff's recommendation and trying to break that up. Thank you, Director Teal. That's a good call to action to have all of us ask our networks, um, you know, ask around with the different data sources that we use in our cities and our counties and different agencies to see if there is um, something more we could provide. I know Andy and Brad have been pretty exhaustive in their analysis, but you know, we might be able to uh, break this one loose. So thank you for that encouragement and reminder that we can all help out, Director Teal. Director Coombs? Yes. So. I think too, like when you look at, for example, Aurora, and I think this is true of a lot of our kind of more suburban areas, it's partially about the cost of housing and partially about the availability of jobs that meet that cost of housing and the distance that people have to travel to have access to those jobs, the time people spend traveling to have access to those jobs, not just what they pay. Because I think the cost of transportation and how it relates to your housing is pretty complex. And so hopefully there are data sets that kind of provide that type of information that could really assist with addressing those equity concerns. Um, but the other thing that, um, that I would wanna note is that the measures that were included as kind of alternatives are 
also incredibly important. So I wonder if there's a way that we can still have some modification that includes those other measures about adequacy and habitability issues of the housing that people can get, as well as looking at the impact of transportation on their quality of life. Uh, so. Thank you, Director Coombs. Director Mulvey? Yeah, I, I'm agreeing with the group on on this, but um, for a couple other reasons. First of all, I'm I'm I've got a problem. You know, with with all due respect, if we don't have data, remove the performance measure. Does it make sense to me? If we still need to measure it, so therefore, if we don't have a ruler, so we're not going to measure it. That's the part that stuck me stuck in my craw. But um, then further on the issue of how much transportation costs. I'm wondering if we should be thinking about in our highly vehicle mobile area that's never going to change from being highly vehicle mobile, no matter how many things we implement, we're still going to have snowy days when people can't go another way. We're still going to have a tremendous amount of people driving vehicles, no matter how much induced demand we create. So why can we not measure the amount of cost it is to purchase a vehicle? to purchase gas, to go on tollway roads. If somebody, if the congestion is so bad or the route is so long, they might have to take E470 or something like that. Is it, are we now pushing people into more expensive EVs? Those are costs that can be measured. So um, those are my two inputs that are a little bit different. And I would agree with what's already been stated to include this cost measure measure, um, performance measure. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mulvey. And I think that's a really helpful segue into the equity slides that Andy was about to move on to. Uh, so for economic vitality, this is the last grouping I've got. Uh, we're proposing no changes to the existing measures that are on this screen. Uh, as with the other stuff, we'll extend out to a proposed uh, new target for 2050. Uh, the significant change here is that staff is proposing a new measure around inclusion that I've got here on the next slide. Um, we have, uh, a, as a part of our small area gap area forecast gap analysis that we shared last fall, we adapted some other methodologies to try and map out access to opportunity and, and the impact of that. Uh, that's still an important mapping exercise to look at different places, distances, travel modes available, and try and understand how that system works. But these proposed measures that we've got here on the screen try to get at the other end of all this. That, that what's the uh, result of increasing access to opportunities? It, it would be inclusion. And so we've included two options here. Both are adapted from uh, the Brookings Institution's Metro Monitor report, uh, but replica replicable for our regional boundary uh, using the same data and methodology that they use. Uh, these are measures that our partners at the Metro Denver Chamber are also considering as part of their uh, Prosper Colorado initiative. Uh, staff have focused on earnings and income uh, from choices from Brookings. Employment rate is a little complicated by the definitions of who is in or out of the labor force uh, and does not typically reflect underemployment. Relative poverty rate is complicated by changing cutoff points over time. Uh, earnings reflects un unemployment, underemployment, and the extent of poverty. And so the two options we focused on here are racial inclusion. What's the gap in median earnings between the non-Hispanic white population and for people of color? Or an, another uh, option is the geographic inclusion measure that they've uh, made at Brookings, which is what's the gap in, in household income between areas with a higher median income and areas with a lower median income? What they use is the, the 80th percentile census tract and the 20th percentile census tract. And so uh, with the permission of the chair, I'm, I'm happy to hear more questions or comments um, on the measures that staff have proposed for removal. Uh, measures staff is still workshopping with, uh, with TAC or the other two measures that I've shared tonight as potential additions. And we're also curious about whether staff should spend time looking at interim or nearer term targets that would happen between now and 2050 uh, to help provide some guideposts along the way to 2050. 
Thank you, Andy, for these questions. And just as a reminder, as we were taking questions throughout the presentation, all of our comments have been registered and documented to this point. So you don't need to reiterate what's been said. But if there are additional thoughts with the new information or if this has brought something to clarity for you, please let us know now. Director Levy. Well, thank you. Um, and on, on the, um, the additional um, inclusion um, metrics or criteria here, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, so if the, this falls under the topic or the goal that, that the region's economy prospers or the vision statement when all residents have access to opportunities. And um, it, it seems like to me that, there, that, the, that the, the access to jobs in these communities is really important. Um, and the numbers that, that you're proposing um, are rates of employment, rates of poverty, rates of income. And I think one of the biggest hurdles to um, widespread prosperity, equitable prosperity is that good jobs aren't located in a lot of communities. And so I, could we add something or uh, I guess you're not really proposing metrics here, but um, the proximity to high quality jobs or transportation access to high quality jobs, something of that nature, um, as well as some metrics around proximity of um, uh, of full service grocery stores and the kinds of things that make communities livable and equitable and, and healthy places to live. Thank you, Director Levy. Director Brackett. Yes, <clears throat> well, first of all, um, thank you for those uh, equity inclusion uh, new metrics. I'm really glad to see those being included. Um, your questions here for uh, the board uh, prompted me to think a little bit more about the greenhouse gas emissions targets. Um, also, uh, following up on Director Seitz's question about the last time that those got updated. So, just want to put out there that since you're talking about the possibility of interim targets, and we do have guidance on statewide greenhouse gas targets from Senate Bill um, 1261, um, that perhaps we could this year. Uh, include um, updated uh, targets uh, for an interim and a 2050 based on that, the uh, statewide goals, and then refine those when the rulemaking is finished and it comes back to us with the Dr. Cog specific targets. So I think that's something worth considering uh, when we come back and make these final. Thank you, Director Brockett. That's a nice proposal. Director Mulvey? Yeah, um, pivoting back to Director Levy, the concept of um, measuring the availability of food in an area is a good one, in my view. There are a lot of food deserts, and that's if we're going to. I'm not, I, I have an issue with having metrics that don't have to do with transportation sometimes, but putting all that aside, if there's going to be an inclusionary concept here, then measuring whether or not there's availability of food and whether or not there's a housing desert, like some areas of North Den Denver are a complete housing desert. And it's not my area, but I think it's a very good metric because it, it does point to whether or not there is equity. Um, and if the only place you could live is a place where there's a food desert and no grocery store, that matters. So, and I'm, I'm thinking of some things going on in Denver right now, which some of you might be aware of, but um, that should be considered. And then if you do consider that, consider also whether or not fresh food is available, you know, actual fresh vegetables and groceries. So that's just my two cents on inclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Maurer. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of go with Director Mulvey and kind of go outside of things, but I think with the past year, how things have been, maybe we can all relate to my comment. It's about access to internet and affordability for internet. 
because that is relating to what we do every day now, like what we're doing tonight. So I, I, I didn't see anything in there that kind of looked at that. So I just thought maybe that has that been considered? Thank you, um, Director Maurer and um, Andy and Brad, I think, you know, you guys included a lot of links to previous meetings, but I think for the next time when we're looking at the adoption of these uh, updates, it'd be good to just send everybody in a separate email, just a link to the full document so everybody can refresh on all the measures we're not talking about tonight too, just, um, just for background, because there's a lot of new members and sometimes when we get everything as a bunch of links, it's hard to remember to click on them all. So I think that'd be a good refresher too, to send everybody. Director Peck. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I listen to this discussion tonight, in my mind, it's broken down into two areas in that in the urban area, the discussion actually uh, could be the about the cost, the cost of housing, the cost of transportation. But when we're talking about the uh, suburban areas or the people in food deserts, we're also, we're just really talking about the cost of living when we bring in food deserts, internet uh, congestion, uh, being close to trans transit stations. Um, so I, I just see this broken down kind of in two parts and where one set of measurements work in the urban areas where you do have things that are close by, et cetera. But in the urban, but I'm sorry, in the rural areas, in the uh, areas outside of, of, of urban, we're looking at totally different metrics from my, from my perspective. So um, I, I just think we should take that into consideration that these metrics that we're using right now don't actually address the regional. It, it addresses urban areas the way I'm, I'm looking at it. So I, I would like it to address regional, which would be cost of living in my, in my opinion. Thank you, Director Peck. Director Marlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to express support for Director Seats and Brockett's request that we consider modifying the greenhouse gas emissions goal sooner than later. Um, it, it seems like we could use the existing state targets as a start to the conversation. Thank you um, very much. And um, it looks like Brad Calvert is going to follow up on all of our comments. Brad? Yeah, I was actually going to mostly use it as a closeout, uh, just in case this was sort of the last uh, moment. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for the conversation tonight. It was really, really, really helpful. Um, and Andy alluded to this, uh, it's helpful on two fronts. Uh, when the board adopted the Metro Vision Plan, you ultimately adopted um, sort of a dynamic approach to performance measurement and management. There are core performance measures, that's what we're talking about tonight, but we are also committed to basically bringing forward data, information, and compelling stories that tell the story of how the region is doing. Uh, through the lens of MetroVision. So everything we heard tonight, staff can figure out some way uh, to integrate that into that holistic uh, sort of approach that the board established related to performance uh, management for the MetroVision plan. And I will use that to segue very briefly um, to my moment of affirmation uh, yesterday. Uh, I was talking to a woman who was working on her, on her dissertation. Her dissertation is focused on uh, regions and performance uh, management. She's done a scan of 30 regions. She's doing a case study on five. And she, inter she interviewed me yesterday. I described the board's process, our process for how we actually identify uh, measures. And she was over the moon impressed. Um, she just really thought it was a really great way of, of thinking about both this notion of Data needs to be re reliable, routinely, routinely available, relevant to what you're trying to measure. But at the same time, you can do these other things on the side that are also really important to telling the story of how your region is doing relative to the goals and the plan that you've established. So just that was my moment of affirmation at the end of the day yesterday that, that even when these conversations uh, can, can get a little murky and hard, uh, someone on the outside was like, that's a really great way of handling it. So kudos to everyone tonight and to past boards uh, that have had these conversations with us. So thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you very much, Brad. And thank you to Andy for taking us through that presentation this evening. That was really great. And we look forward to seeing uh, the synthesis of all of these comments that were provided tonight. And that takes us to our committee reports portion of the meeting. And so these will just be brief reports made from the members of our group that attend these various committees. So first is the report on the State Transportation Advisory Committee, which I attended with Director Mauer. And they um, went over the legislative session, which included the Senate Bill 260 overview, which we heard a little bit about earlier tonight. So I won't repeat that. We also had a presentation that was really fascinating on induced travel demand and whether or not it's real or not. And the answer was that, that it is, but people might call it different things. So, you know, one person might prefer to call it um, something and someone else might prefer to call it induced demand. But um, Eric Sabina, the manager on information management from CDOT says, yes, it is in fact real. And we looked at some data and information around that. So that was an interesting presentation. And um, we also got a, an update from William Johnson on transportation asset performance reporting. And it was a presentation that would have made Jerry Stiegel proud talking about performance measures and asset management and how CDOT looks at those things. And that's what we covered this month. That takes us to our report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. And that will be Bud Starker this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, the uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus met last uh, on June 3rd. We had an overview of federal and state stimulus uh, investments with Alib uh, Overman, with the policy advisor in the Legislative Council with the Governor's Office, and Aaron Ray. We had uh, also a uh, report on Bill for Zero update with Dr. Jamie Reif with the um, uh, M MDHI, and uh, that would conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Director Baker with the report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Thank you, Madam Chair. We met on May 21st and heard from Michael Davies, the RTD Government Relations uh, Officer, Troy Whitmar, RTD District K Director, Shelley Cook, RTD District L Director, and Andy Carrison from CDOT Legislative Liaison. We talked uh, with the CDOT staff about ensuring CDOT accountability and transparency within Senate Bill 260. RTD also provided an update on operations and discussed how they would potentially be involved in any front range passenger rail plans should um, Senate Bill 238 create that uh, and, uh, and also how they would be involved in any other Amtrak rail proposals coming down from the federal government. Our next meeting will be June 25th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. That takes us to our report on the Advisory Committee on Aging, our wonderful Jayla Sanchez Warren. Hi. Um, like you all, uh, the Aging Advisory Committee also talked about transportation. We have a transportation subcommittee. You know, this is such a vital service that, that we provide. Um, and, and this committee was developed to think about addressing the needs now, but really planning for the future. Um, the baby boomers will turn 65 in just a few, about 11 years, and, uh, and the peak of the baby boomers actually. And so how are we gonna prepare for this uh, huge uh, surge in demand? Um, we heard from the Douglas County Aging Resources Volunteer Driver Program. Um, they're one of the most successful volunteer driver programs in the region, uh, a partner of ours, we fund them. We wanted to learn how they were so successful and, and, and learn about their growth over the, the last um, few years. We talked about some of their challenges, which always include insurance when you're talking about a vo volunteer program um, and the insurance costs. Um, we talked about the importance of coordination, all the things that you have to coordinate with a volunteer program. You know, sometimes people think, well, a volunteer program is free. It's not free. There's a lot of costs associated. You have to have staff to support those volunteers and you have to have the infrastructure needed. Um, we talked about the training and then how COVID affected um, the program. We talked about the benefits of the program. This is a very low cost program. Um, it, it develops personal relationships in the community that drivers get to know, um, the older adults, they develop friendships. It has a very community feel, which is unlike some of our other programs. We also had a presentation from um, the Ride Alliance program. 
This is a program that the Area Agency on Aging, Dr. Cog, inherited from um, uh, uh, Dr. Mack. It was a, a Federal Highway uh, grant, um, and it, it, it was to develop and improve transportation. So we developed a hub uh, that allows uh, rides to be requested from a, a whole lot of available providers. We got we got really far in that process before we ran out of the grant money and the grant time. Um, we talked about what needs to be done to continue that program and is it still viable and is it still something worth investing time and money in and it, it, the consensus is yes it is, even though things are changing rapidly in this world. Um, we, we need to figure out how to add a billing and payment feature to this this hub and um, because of people if the providers don't get paid uh, timely they're not going to be a part of it right but it really could increase the efficiency of, of service it um, it could add more service um, so you know maybe via would pick somebody up and take them to the doctor's office uh, and then uh, hop skip drive um, would take them home from the doctor's office. So it allows for a lot of flexibility that we don't currently have in our um, system now. It's gonna be a big challenge trying to figure out how we are going to deal with the transportation needs of, a, of an older population. Remember, we are the second fastest aging state in the, in, in the country and um, there's gonna be big demand and we gotta start thinking about it now because as you know, it takes a long time to get these systems in place. So that's my report. Thank you very much. Uh, Executive Director Rex will tell us about the report from the Regional Air Quality Control Council or just the Regional Air Quality Council. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at our June meeting, I'll just mention a few um, items. The first is we have a, a, a new rack board chair. Uh, it's former Senator Mike Foote that I'm sure many of you, many of you know. Um, so that was great to see, see the former Senator. Uh, we had a legislative update, kind of a wrap up of the session. Um, we had what seems to be a monthly presentation on the employee traffic reduction program. Um, it was a little different though. Uh, they, we, the board decided to take a position of support of the proposed ETRP rule. Um, just as an FYI, I abstain from that vote for for the reasons we discussed earlier. We don't we don't have a formal position on that on that um, on that rule. So, um, so that was done. And we also had an um, kind of an ozone season update, just where we are currently. Um, we have had some we had some high readings early in the year, um, and I'm I'm waiting with uh, with some trepidation about the uh, the weather we've been having over the last week or so to see what those readings are going to be. So. Cross your fingers. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director X. And next we have E470, uh, present past Chair Dyack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we talked about a 38th Bridge aesthetic uh, ARTA uh, proposed or presented to the E470 board. Uh, they wanna consider uh, putting a signature bridge in uh, to kind of deviate from our traditional red rail bridge on E470. Uh, the board uh, indicated to uh, to continue that discussion with our staff. We, we are we are interested in that. Uh, additionally, we had some IT uh, movement. We're in the process uh, of setting aside um, or having the ability to uh, rewrite our back office software. Um, E470 does all the back office toll collections for not only E470 Northwest Parkway, but all the other hot lanes, managed lanes within Colorado. Uh, so we were about to embark on a rewrite on a 15 year old software and we approved a couple of IT contracts. Um, let's see, traffic, uh, our traffic counts uh, the end of May. If you compare uh, 2021 to uh, 2020, we are up 10.8 percent. If you compare 2021 to the same time period in 2019, we are down 25.4. So we're hoping that traffic continues to increase as we come out of this uh, this COVID era. Madam Chair, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a report from CDOT, Director White. 
Thank you, Chair. And I'll start by saying how wonderful it was to see uh, Chair Stolzman in person at the SAC meeting. There were only a handful of us for our, our first attempt at a hybrid meeting, but it was, it was very nice. Um, so that was a, a good overview of that meeting as usual. You know, the only thing I'll add tonight really from the CDOT end is just our, our enthusiasm of the passage of Senate Bill 260. I'll say as uh, somebody who does transportation planning for a living, it is quite wonderful to be in a place where we uh, we know what our funding is gonna be um, over the, the next few years instead of a very unpredictable situation. So uh, we, like many of you, are still wrapping our arms around a lot of pieces of that legislation. There'll be a lot more to come um, from CDOT on that end, particularly with some of the environmental provisions, uh, but it's a, a good problem to have. So that's all I have tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have a report on Fast Tracks. Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair and Directors. This is Bill Van Meter with RTD. The RTD Board of Directors did not hold a planning capital programs and Fast Tracks committee meeting this month, so I have nothing to report from the committee. I do have one brief report, and that is regarding the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, or um, PEL study, as um, it, it's been variously called. RTD staff is working with local jurisdictions to uh, advance a scope of work and we anticipate bringing a briefing to our board of directors in the coming weeks, month or so, um, regarding that scope of work and asking them for formal authorization to go into a consultant selection and RFP process, presumably late this summer, um, and with an intent for a notice to proceed by the end of the year or early next year. That concludes my report. Thank you. That takes us through our um, informational briefings and to our administrative items. Our next meeting is July 21st. And I would like to ask if there are other matters by any members. Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.